afternoon. I'm so pleased that you're all here, that you joined me for the first seminar of the 50th anniversary of the Expo. So congratulations to all of you for joining us. My name is Connie Seafelt. I'm a dairy farmer from northeastern Wisconsin. Um, I am on the DMI Board of Directors and UDIA, and I'm also the chair of the Wisconsin Milk Marketing Board. So make sure you check both of those booths out. They're fantastic. And it's my pleasure today to introduce Tom Gallagher, Chief Executive Officer of Dairy Management Incorporation. Tom has a proven track record in leading national and regional organizations, major consumer brands, and others to align around our shared values, goals, and priorities that we have that support our industry and the strategic planning and engagement to advance the U.S. dairy industry. Tom has 20 plus years at Dairy Management Inc. and he represents very well the interests of America's dairy farmers to help grow public trust, sales for milk, cheese, yogurt, and other dairy foods. During this time, Tom has worked with industry leaders successfully um, from a commodity gen generic advertising marketing mod model to growing short and long-term sales by working with and through broader food beverage industry partners. This includes partnerships with major U.S. food companies and global leaders, and I'm going to name a few, McDonald's, Domino's, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell. Any of you ever hear of those? Anyway, he has done this to drive sales through menu development, product research, and digital innovation that benefits U.S. dairy and partner companies. Tom also leads the business strategy and operations of the National Dairy Council. And at the direction of dairy farm leaders, Tom also established the Innovation Center for U.S. Dairy to bring together dairy company leaders to work pre-competitively on shared priorities that help us all in the industry. Additionally, he is the CEO of the U.S. Dairy Export Council, which represents the global trade interests of U.S. dairy farmers, processors, and cooperatives, ingredient suppliers, and export traders. Um, prior to these leadership positions, um, Tom also served in the U.S. League of Saving Institutions. And I find it interesting to learn that Tom earned his bachelor, earned a Bachelor of Science degree in political science. And he has a Master of Science degree in public administration. Um, Tom, that being said, I guess I want to know why you're not running for President of the United States. <laughs> step down. I <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, and so I introduce, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Tom Gallagher, Chief Executive Officer. Thanks, Thank Connie. You, wow, I'm tired after all that. I didn't know I did all that. Um, I, I'm not a grumpy person by nature, but today I may be a little bit because I hurt my back. And if you ever had a bad back and you have back spasms, actually standing is the best position. So it's, it's good to stand. But, uh, you know, the only thing Connie left out is that I have two children, a daughter, 23, who's the boss of everything, and a son, 21, and then two dogs who are two years old, and the kids are almost as well behaved as the dogs they're getting there, but uh, not there yet. So, you know, I have a couple things I want to share with you about sales and about trust, which are completely tied together these days. You know, the, the trust in, in the product is so important. But uh, anywhere along the lines that you have a question, feel free to uh, ask a question and stop. It's more important that we're able to answer the questions you might have as we go along. So if we could just go to the first slide. Um, I want to just provide a background that there's, there's two organizations back in 1995 that farmers were paying into, the National Dairy Board, which receives the nickel of the 15 cents, and, uh, and that goes through USDA and the Secretary of Agriculture appoints 36 members to a board called National Dairy Board. And then there was a, a, a state and regional organization which uh, these state and regionals get the 10 cents of the 15 cents the farmers put into the checkoff. And prior to 1995, uh, these two mostly national organizations in some ways were competitive with each other and, you know, redundant. And the farmers in 95 said, look, we're, we're not paying a nickel and a dime, we're paying 15 cents, we expect you to use our money more efficiently, 
So they formed Dairy Management Incorporated. So of all the uh, alphabet soup of organizations up there, the only organization that has staff is Dairy Management Incorporated. And then these other companies that are below Dairy Management, we'll talk about in just a couple minutes as, uh, as we go through why those were created to execute against the strategy to increase sales worldwide. Um, so that's kind of the background. These, these eight, 17 or so state and regional organizations and the National Dairy Board together have formed Dairy Management Incorporated. And then Dairy Management Incorporated has created some other companies, like I said, that we'll go through in just a minute. Um, I guess the second thing you should know, if we go to the next slide, is really, you know, the fundamental, the easiest way to describe our business plan as a change. You know, we, uh, about 10 years ago, looked at the way, you know, checkoff was working and the, the basic things we were doing. We said, look, we're doing, for years, advertising and retail promotions. And maybe back in the 80s when we were doing those things or into the 90s, there was enough money to effectively do those things. The, the way television worked in those days were three essential channels and people watching advertising instead of flipping through it. You know, maybe, maybe it was effective, but there came a point where it was clear that the advertising, even though it was winning awards, world-class, worldwide awards, got milk, uh, milk that does a body good before that, behold the power of cheese, uh, they really weren't, you couldn't really say they were impacting sales, particularly in fluid milk. And we said, with the dairy farmers le leading the way on the board, there's obviously other issues than advertising that aren't being satisfied in this, uh, in this situation with fluid milk in particular, but with all our dairy products. So what if we take a step back and say, maybe TV advertising is no longer the most effective way to go. Maybe we need to work with the industry who actually has product to get the industry to do things that would create innovative products, create marketing efforts, create new activities that they weren't up to that point performing as brands, particularly in milk. If you think about milk, it's really a commodity. And up until recently, which we'll talk about, there was very little advertising or marketing on the, on the part of brands. Really, it was generic promotion that took that over. And what, what happened as a result of that is the brands were disincented from acting like brands. And we wanted to incent them to act like brands, incent them to spend money on marketing and advertising, incent them to do product development. So what we said in this chart is that red circle is unmet demand. Now, in, in days gone by, we would say, here's the product we produce, and we'd give it to retailers, or you know, retailers would get it, or food service would get it, and then try to sell that to consumers. It may not be what consumers want, and a good example is fluid milk. You take the white gallon. The white gallon is a great product, as especially great in the 50s, 60s, and 70s when people were eating at home. Today, more than 50% of your dollars are spent away from home. The white gallon doesn't satisfy that need. There was a whole bunch of need out there for something other than the white gallon. And going back even 12 or 15 years, just to give a simple example, you know, McDonald's was offering milk in cardboard containers that were square. Cars, since the 70s, had round holes, all right? Makes no sense. So we went into McDonald's, and that was our first test of the new business plan, and said, let's do round resealable milk. And, you know, I think a lot of people know the story. They went from 49 cardboard containers per store per week. That's 14,000 stores, 49 containers per store per week, to they're at 350 per store per week now. That's enormous change, all right? And it's a simple innovation. It's just a change from a cardboard square container to fit in a round hole, all right? So we started testing the business plan and said there are other things we can do that are more effectively using farmer money to unlock demand, okay, and increase dairy sales and trust. So what are those things? So we tested those thing, things, and I'll show you some examples in just a minute. If you had to take a snapshot, uh, but if you look at this, the way I, th I like to think about this, if, if the dairy farmers are, through the checkoff, providing us with X millions of dollars, the way I like to look at this is, where would you take that money and most effectively lay it down to increase sales of dairy products? 
So don't, don't think of yourself as an advertising company or a retail promotion company or a product development company or an insights company. Think of yourself as the voice of the farmer when milk leaves the farm and getting people to increase sales through innovation. Okay, that, that's the way I like to think of meeting unmet demand and you, most effectively using farmer money. Um, the, last, the next slide is what we call the triangle. And there's three parts to this triangle and I'm gonna focus uh, first on the upper left. The upper left is, uh, as, as uh, Connie talked about, some of the companies we work with. You see some of their, lo their logos here. I'll tell you in a, in, a, in a nutshell, we are working with individual companies, eight milk companies and several brands like uh, Taco Bell, Domino's, McDonald's, uh, Pizza Hut, and others. And, and the, the purpose of those partnerships is to find partners that we feel are strategically aligned with dairy farmer interests. We may not agree on everything, but we agree on enough that we can say, yeah, we can work together, we have shared values. If we work with you, we believe that the category that you're working in, whether that's with McDonald's and, and, uh, and round resealable milk or with Domino's and Pizza Hut with pizza, if we work with you, we can change the trajectory of how that pro the products are going in that channel. Uh, give you a quick example. One of our very first partners seven years ago was Domino's, all right? And the dairy farmers took a risk. We said, we're try gonna try a new business plan. And at that time, pizza represented 25% of all cheese sold in the United States. It was on a five or six year steady decline, okay? The consumption was straight down, right? We said, we believe it's because people are taking cheese off the pizza. Not only are they taking cheese off the pizza, they're using the dollars that used to be marketing pizza to market chicken wings and salad bars and other things. We've gotta change that. We've gotta, we've gotta make a bet that if we put more cheese on the pizza and incent these companies to put more cheese on the pizza, that their sales will increase and then they will spend more money on marketing pizza. And so we started to work with Domino's. We created with them six new products, all right? And, uh, and after nine months of working with them, the trajectory that was five years straight down, it started to flatten and since then has gone up flattened up, flattened up, and flattened. And I'll show you the billions and billions of pounds sold through pizza because of what they did than everybody else had to do. And when we first started working with Domino's, if we put in a dollar, they were putting in maybe five dollars. Okay, today, if for every dollar we put in, let's just, we're putting in, I'll just, we're putting in, um, for every dollar we're putting in, I don't want to say publicly what we're actually spending on each individual partner, but they have more than tripled. They're putting in over $180 million that they took from marketing other products because the, it proved out that if you put more cheese on the pizza and different types of cheese, you will sell more pizza. They took that money from other marketing avenues and moved it over to this. So. Not only did it work for pizza at the retail level, we then said to them, you don't have a school business and you should think about schools because pizza is the number one thing kids like at school or want at school, but it's, it had a 92, believe, listen to this, it had a 92% dislike factor. The frozen pizza, it was, it was highly disliked, but it was the number one thing chosen. And if you've been to school meals, I think maybe you can understand why. So we said there's an opportunity here to create a better tasting pizza that meets all the USDA guidelines. So they brought in all their suppliers, sauce makers, cheese people, you know, the crust people. Uh, we brought in nutritionists, created various prototypes, created a thing called Smart Slice. It's now in, in your seat sheets that you'll see. It's in over 6,500 schools. It meets all the USDA guidelines. USDA, USDA supports it. It has a pound of cheese on the pizza, a pound. All right. When they bring this pizza into these schools, you see more than 25% increase in the number of kids that go through the lunch line. It's the equivalent, it's been in the last year, the equivalent of if they opened another 40, over 40 Domino's franchises. 
is how big their school business has become. We also worked with them beyond, and this shows you, the, the reason I'm giving you this example on Domino's, we talked about the change at retail and how that was catalytic to the whole category. We talked about them moving into schools at no expense to us. Okay, we didn't pay for anything there. And then we talked, now the next thing is we said, you have chains overseas, and particularly in the pack rim. And so we worked with them, and we worked with Pizza Hut and Papa John's to get U.S. cheese on pizza in the pack rim. So that if you're the head of Fonterra in New Zealand and you order a Domino's pizza, you're eating America cheese. And I kind of really like that. I really like that idea. Um, so one partner can really, with uh, the initial investment and no more than that, really take that partnership, if you have the right partner, and expand it out. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, th these are some of the values I put up there in partnership, and I kind of covered these. We, we want to we pick partners that can change the trajectory of sales, all right? That can change what otherwise would be, have been a dormant category or a category where we think there needed to be growth. Our, our second partner, along with Domino's, was McDonald's. And our partnership there, when they, they, said, they told us they were going to introduce this new concept called McCafe, they wanted McDonald's to be a, de a destination of choice for beverage. We said, well, we'll tell you what. You guys in menu development at McDonald's, very little dollars. You have very little money to develop menu items. You have a billion dollars to spend on advertising, but very little money to spend on product development. We'll put in three or four product development people. They can work together with your staff and create all the new McDonald's drinks. McDonald's McCafe alone has sold, is selling over 600 million pounds of fluid milk through coffee, all right? That's a big deal, and every one of those products, any product that you eat at McDonald's or Taco Bell or Pizza Hut or Domino's, and I could name others, that has any dairy in it whatsoever, one of your people that you employ developed that product, all right? So, uh, you know, I, I think the McDonald's story is, is another success story that, you know, when they went to 24-hour breakfast, that was a huge deal uh, because that, that is a lot of dairy that goes into that. Uh, another, you know, so these are some of the values. Another thing is number six, though. It goes beyond sales. It's providing support, credibility, and coming to our defense in difficult times. You think about Domino's. They have on their board 5% stock is owned by HSUS. They've been being pressed for years to take positions that you and I would not like. They won't take, they're not taking those positions, not just because we have a partnership, because they believe in what we do, what the farmers do, and how they treat their farm uh, animals and others. So we, that's another part of the partnership that there's value to, is making sure that we stay as aligned with some of these people who could change the nature of production agriculture in an instant, if they decide to go left or right of you know, what is good business practice for dairy farmers. So that's another value to the partnership. If we go to the next slide, um, let's just go back one for a second, if we can. Um, so I, I'd like to just keep those up there so you stay focused on every dollar that we put in, like I said, Domino's, it started out five to one, it's now at least 20 to one. Uh, in some cases, it's much bigger. Like with McDonald's, we put in a handful of millions of dollars. They sp and their, their deal is, you guys put the product development people in here, and we will spend a billion dollars a year marketing the products. So they spend a billion dollars a year marketing the, the dairy products. Um, okay, so if we go to the next slide, about three or four years ago, the dairy farmers said, we got to change the trajectory of milk. Can we do for fluid milk what we did with, with uh, pizza cheese and pizza? We said, well, let's see. So we went to the industry. We asked for requests for proposals. How can we change the trajectory of fluid milk? We got back a bunch of uh, requests for proposal that were less than, less than uh, interesting and innovative, all right? So we said, we've, we've got to take a step back from here. We've, we've either got to really look for people who are willing to invest in changing the business, in, invest in plants that will produce something other than only the white gallon milk, invest in, in new product development, invest in marketing dollars. So we found eight partners. 
and uh, I hope there's eight up here. Uh, there's probably seven, four, eight. eight, eight. All right, we got a good slide. Uh, you know, and they're all very interesting partners for different reasons. For example, Kroger, we're doing product development with Kroger on new fluid products. And the advantage to us or the dairy farmer in working with Kroger is they allow us to test different parts of the store, which, you know, it's not just the white gallon or, or the little pints or whatever it is in the back of the store. We, we will be able over the next couple of years to test front end coolers or other things, which, which is hard with some of these retailers because Coke and Pepsi have those areas locked down, right? But Kroger has said, we'll work with you on tests. Um, you know, you, you take a look at uh, some of the other companies up there, you, you're familiar with them. The one that says Coca-Cola Fair Life, that was the big prize. That's the big deal, all right? And here's why it's the big deal. When we went into this, we said, we have got to find somebody who will change the game, okay? Somebody who will make milk look like a brand, act like a brand. Invest in product development. Invest in advertising. Invest in retail promotions. Do all the things that you should, as a dairy farmer, expect people who take and buy your product and then market it that you should expect them to do. You should hold them accountable for doing, okay? That hasn't been done in years, all right? So Fair Life is a partnership between select milk producers and Coca-Cola. Now Coca-Cola, needless to say, has a lot of marketing smarts. They have an incredible distribution system. They have people in stores every day that are resetting cases and stuff. So we said, we would love to work with you as a partner if you're investing in fluid milk. They built the plant up in Michigan for a quarter billion dollars. Said, okay, that's a good start. You know, and our other partners, that was one of the key criteria. What infrastructure, what plant changes are you looking at making before we will do a deal with you? Okay, that number says probably 500 million behind me. That number is probably now closer to 800 million dollars in plant changes. That's what we need in order to provide today's consumer that I talked about who's eating away from home more what they, what they really want. Now the beauty of working with Coke in addition to what I said is, yeah, they put a quarter billion dollars into, pro into a plant and then they put a bunch of money into product development. They also put in the last year over $100 million into advertising and retail promotion and other promotion. That's more than all the other brands added together the prior five years. And as soon as they did what they did, guess what happened? Lactate added another $25 million to their marketing budget. Dean's created a national brand and created a national advertising strategy. So that's the catalytic effect that we were looking for. It is really critical that this, to dairy farmers that this product succeed. This is, this is competing against soy, it's competing against almond. It's competing against, in some senses, organic, which, you know, because it's the price point there. It is not in competition with conventional fluid milk, like a gallon, because of the price point. It's 52 ounces. It's much more expensive. It's priced at the, at the you know, the juice, the milk juice level. And what we found through a year is their growth has been exactly what they'd hoped it would be. They were looking to build another plant, which is a huge investment, obviously. Uh, secondly, they're taking most of their share either from the milk juices or from people who have completely left the category. So 58% of what is drunk through as Fair Life milk is coming from our competitors or people who left the category. That's a big deal. That's a huge story. Yes, sir. Yeah. What's different about the milk itself? Yeah, fair life, what's the difference? Okay, it's a, it's a milk product. It's uh, higher uh, in protein. It's uh, lactose-free, but not marketed as such. It's really marketed as, you know, higher protein. But their marketing uh, slant, you should look at their, at their uh, website, the Fair Life website. They're, they really talk about what dairy farmers do for the land. You know, it's, it's really focused on the personal story of dairy farmers. I think they've got a nice marketing uh, mix to it. And, and as it's, it's priced at a premium because of some of the qualities that it has, like I said, the, the higher protein, the, 
the lactose free and uh, more calcium and some, some of the other qualities. So, um, but I think one of the big things to answer your question is they're marketing against it. They didn't just put it on the shelf and go, oh, gee, six months went by, we didn't have sales. You can't do that. That's, what, that's what's been happening for 50 years in this business. But I think they're going to change that paradigm. They've already changed it to some degree. So when we think about fluid milk, it's really been a disaster the last six years in particular. Now, the last year, it's gotten better. But let, let, me, give you, let me just throw some numbers at you. Overall, the category in the last year was down 700 million pounds, OK? Our partners were up, like Fair Life and some of the others, 300 million pounds. So without our partnerships, the category would have been down a billion pounds. All right. So most of what we're doing is still smaller bottle, 52 ounce, 96 ounce is very popular for some reason with consumers, but smaller bottle than that. What we've got to do is figure out how to satisfy uh, larger bottle, you know, like the gallon, how we refurbish the gallon and how we bring bigger sizes and, and back into the family. Because even though fewer families are eating at home, as little as 7% have a meal, you know, there's different statistics, have a meal together once a week. Uh, there's, still, there's still room to grow. There's still room to grow that, that gallon business. But it may, it may be multi-gallon packs. I don't know exactly what it is, but you know, our first step is to try to, to, to get this fixed. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, I talked about McDonald's. They were probably one of the first to convert to butter once the government got off the fat issue and they realized that they made a mistake and that actually there's a positive to fat and uh, maybe some of the issue is the carbs and they started to change their dietary guidelines. But stepping back from McDonald's, which that's 600 million pounds of milk in the form of butter at McDonald's because of you and having product development people there who, you know, because you don't just go, here's butter. You have to test it through our product development people. You have to, uh, our battery is low. Uh, but that's okay, I have these slides memorized. Um, the, uh, the, you know, you have to test it. You have to see how it melts. You have to see how it works with the different products. And then your people that you, you pay for go out and train the franchises to, to do those things, okay? So, uh, you know, that, that's a real positive. But for years, we were investing your money in the research that really showed the value of fat. And it was your research that led to that story on Time Magazine, if you remember, a year ago, fat is back, butter is back. Uh, that was your research. And for McDonald's to do this has led to others then to follow. And uh, we expect more chains to follow. And I'll, I'll show you an interesting slide about this in a minute. So if we move forward, these are just other products. Just so you know, we cover, you know, whether with McDonald's and with some of our other partners, it's not just, you know, the cheeseburger. It's not just the lattes. It's ice cream in different forms. We, we are the ones that created the limited time offering for the mozzarella stick, et cetera. Here you can go ahead. Um, let's switch gears here for a second to Yum. What is Yum? Yum is the owner of Taco Bell, KFC, and Pizza Hut, all right? And we've had a relationship with Taco Bell where we have product development people in Taco Bell. In fact, one of the slides you'll see is there's a slide called the Quesalupa. The Quesalupa, just to give you an idea of this, uh, before we put a person into, into Taco Bell, they had been trying to perfect the Quesalupa and how it worked with cheese and melted and all these things and couldn't get there. Our person went in and worked on it for a few months, cracked the code, got it right, and actually won the Employee of the Year Award, our employee, won their Employee of the Year Award for Yum! Brands, because they consider that that's, that's their biggest innovation in years and something that will carry their product forward. So if you think about those three companies, we have a relationship with them in the U.S. in terms of Pizza Hut and Taco Bell. Now, and I'll just leave the, the number of stores up there, we have a relationship where we're putting a product development person in their store, in their uh, innovation center in Fort Lauderdale to develop 
products for KFC in Latin America. And you go, well, KFC, they, they don't sell a lot of cheese. They don't sell a lot. Of That's the opportunity. They don't. And they ought to be. There are, there's a world of dairy products that will be sold through KFC, not just in Latin America, not just in the United States when we get that deal finished, not just in Southeast Asia, but also in China. I just returned from China. China is ripe for a deal with Yum Brands in, uh, in China. Um, we won't talk about how all, all that works, but the opportunity to work with KFC. Pizza Hut is a slam dunk, right? Okay, we can develop new pizza offerings, we can develop new different pizza things. Taco Bell, 96% of their products already has cheese on it. And, you know, and we'll keep growing products there. KFC is the big prize because of where they are. KFC China, because look at the number of stores uh, outside of the US, KFC China is huge. We did a study that says there's a billion, uh, 1.3 billion pounds of fluid milk to be had in China. It's not going to come by our companies going over there with a brand name and dropping it at retail. A, there's too much competition. B, it costs too much money. The best way to do it is through companies that already exist over there, like a KFC, to bring U.S. milk, which is viewed as safe, which is viewed as highly desirable, through that process. So what I'd like to see happen, in, you know, in addition to the domestic partnership we have, the partnership in Latin America that we have with this, with this group of brands, uh, is one in China and Southeast Asia. And that's what I'll be bringing to the board next time we meet, because it's just an enormous, huge opportunity for us. So if we go to the next slides, um, this is the Queso Loop, one of the products that I talked about earlier. Go ahead. Uh, and so where does that all leave you? The last, so this, this runs through July 16. So in the 12 month period ending July 16, what did sales look like? Well, if you saw a slide that was the prior 12 months to this, you'd see exports was a lot worse. Exports are getting better. One of the issues with exports, a couple of the issues with exports have been the Chinese bought an awful lot of powder a couple years ago and loaded up and are still trying to clear that market, or we're hoping they're trying to clear that market out. Uh, Europe took the, the lid off their production, but I see that all turning around in the next six months because you know, that market will get cleared. The US is the only market right now where production is growing, the other markets are down. So that number's improving. But look at domestic cheese. I mean, some of you were probably around 10 years ago when people were saying, oh, the domestic market, it's, it's, a, it's a mature market. You can't grow anything in the domestic market. That's the largest number that you've ever seen in a 12-month period for domestic cheese utilization and translated to fluid milk. Well, actually, it's the second largest. The prior, if we went back a month, it was 5.5 billion pounds. And where did that come from? A little bit of it came out of retail. Retail is a commodity now, just like fluid milk gallon is a commodity, and the price has been dropping. So some of the retail cheese number went up. But it really is coming out of pizza and out of fast food restaurants led by McDonald's and Taco Bell. All right? And that's your product. That's your people that have developed that. Your people are the result of that, uh, have resulted in that number. Yogurt, a lot of people think when Chobani came in the market, oh, yogurt sales went crazy. Chobani sales went crazy. But yogurt's been flat for years. Yogurt, in fact, if you think about the fluid milk line where you know, the consumption curve starts up and then about the age of 11 starts to go down and flatten out, yogurt has just about the same line. And uh, so that, that's not, it's not been a growth category now. Because Greek yogurt uses more milk to produce, you know, it's, it is still a benefit to dairy farmers. And then the fluid story I talked about a little bit earlier, and I gave you, the, I gave you those numbers. And let me just on the fluid milk side say that for years it was skim milk and 2% that was the growth uh, of the fat levels, not the growth of the category, but of the fat levels. Those two were growing and whole milk was decreasing. Since the fat story, the category is still down, but it's the lower fats are losing and whole fat is going up by about 5% a month. 
So, and that, that is a, a, a clear benefit and a clear win for dairy farmers. If you think about the butter story, let's flip to the next slide. The, uh, the red line is the price of U.S. butter, and the other is the world price. That all coincides with the introduction at McDonald's, all right? Again, that's, that's your checkoff, people, all right? So let's flip to the next. Um, I'm going to just touch a little bit on the bottom here. These companies here at the bottom, whereas the top right are targeted partnerships, this is where we try to work collectively with the whole industry. So you're probably familiar with the U.S. Dairy Export Council that was created by DMI and dairy farmers. We put $18 million into it to, to deal with uh, regulatory issues, trade access issues, uh, and other issues. Members, 120 members, put a million and a half dollars into it. With that million and a half dollars, we're able to do lobbying, because with checkoff you cannot do lobbying. So with the member money, you can do trade policy. And then there's about seven or eight million dollars that come from the government. So if you think of it, it's really a perfect example of producers and processor companies working together on the full range of issues you know, on the world market. So that's the U.S. Dairy Export Council. All the staff of the Export Council are DMI employees. Another company on the far left you should be interested in is the Innovation Center for U.S. Dairy. And then there's Nutrient, which is in the middle. The others are just companies, are not just, but they're companies we work with. But if we go to the next slide, the, what is Nutrient? Nutrient is a company that was created by ourselves and the dairy cooperatives listed up here. And the purpose of this company is to look at technology on farm and make sure that if there's any financial benefit, that it, re, it, it, it goes to new technologies, to manure management, to whatever, whatever it is, if there's any financial benefit, that farmers reap that benefit, okay? And so, like this company, which again is owned by all these individual companies, is doing things like, okay, we'll look at all the people that say they can put in digesters effectively or other nutrient technology or manure management technology, and we'll make sure that we get a list that if farmers or co-ops are interested, they know who are credible sources to use. Uh, we'll, we'll catalog different technologies. Um, and, you know, this is a new company. It's just getting off the ground. But the idea is it's to f move forward on the environmental front faster uh, in a way that farmers, again, like I said, benefit. The other company, the Innovation Center, if we go to that slide, this is kind of like parallel to U.S. Dairy Export Council, but it's in the U.S. To be a b on the board of directors, you need to be a CEO or chairman of a company. And below the chairman and CEOs, there's other companies on committees, all right? Why was this company formed? When myself and some of the farmers went around and talked to the industry, producers, processors, we realized there's a whole bunch we agree on. There's some very important things we disagree on and we'll never agree on. But most of what we do, we can agree on. And why don't we do those things that are pre-competitive together? So for example, when this company, got, when this company was formulated, one of, its group was, uh, one of its committees was a research group. And the issue with sodium and cheese was front and center. So this group said, let's put a, on the committee people from companies that can research how to have good tasting cheese with a little bit less sodium. Right? That's an example. One of the other things that this company did, has done, was a lot of work in the environmental arena. So there's a sustainability council. It actually has 800 people from industry working on that, on that council. There are any, you name a company and they're on this. One of the advantages of what that council did for producers and processors together, but in this case mostly producers, was we created a, a clear baseline for what is the carbon footprint for, to produce a gallon of milk, to produce a pound of cheese, to produce whey, and corrected the record. There were, there were those groups out there like WHO that were saying we were contributing 18% to the carbon you know, emissions, and we were able to correct that record. The other thing that it did because of the work of the Innovation Center, when the Obama administration regulated methane, 
they didn't regulate agriculture. And in their report, they took the, the Innovation Center Sustainability Council, highlighted it and said, that's the model that is proactive, that's finding the way forward without, without regulation. Okay, so there's a number of things that the Innovation Center has done, but in the last year, probably the most important thing to you, if we go to the next slide, is the Innovation Center, uh, which is chaired by the CEO of Land O'Lakes, Chris Polisinski, and you have to remember, DMI devotes very little staff to this. This is really run by the CEOs of these companies and then in some cases their, their uh, underlings. They said, we need to develop a plan to be proactive on these issues of social responsibility, whatever you want to define social responsibility as. It includes animal care, includes the environment, includes labor, includes other issues. So they said, we need to be proactive, we need to get away from absence claims. You know, these, these claims of my milk is antibiotic free. Well, all milk is antibiotic free. We have to get away from that stuff. So the Innovation Center said, let's see if for the first time ever the industry could unify against one strategic plan for social responsibility in the areas I just mentioned. We did that in the course of a year. And th you know, that board includes the CEO of Dean Foods, it includes the CEO of Leprino Foods, it includes the CEO of Maryland, Virginia, it includes the chairman and CEO of DFA. So this is really a first, this is a big deal. And the areas that it agreed on, which you won't be able to read, the six areas that will be proactive on are animal care, food safety, global insights and innovation, so understanding the global markets better, nutrition, wellness, and food security, people and community, and environmental stewardship. And where is this plan gonna go? The purpose of this plan is trust. And to get the, the, my purpose, the way I'd speak to my board members, or, or the, how my board members here have heard me speak about it is, we gotta get off the defensive, okay? Yeah, we gotta clear the record on antibiotics, we gotta clear the record on a few things, and, and we have to still react to those things. But we need to grab the microphone and own it because we have a great story to tell. Let me give you a couple of statistics here. If we go to the next slide. Um, and again, these may be hard in this room to see, but you can see these people here who have low dairy trust, most, most of them, at least from here over, we can't influence them. They want you out of business. They wake up every day trying to figure out how can we get rid of animal agriculture. The people on the far right, they're, they're pretty much in the camp, they're not gonna move. It's those people in the middle. And what are those people in the middle looking for? So if we go to the next slide, these are the kind of things they're looking at. They've changed the definition of food safety. It's not just, you know, it's not about listeria. It's about processing, processing in the food, hormones, antibiotics. They wanna know about transparency. They wanna prove humane treatment. You know. Most people don't have an opinion on how you treat your animals, and that's not a good place to be. It used to be that they just assumed you treated your animals well. Right now, they're open to being influenced either way. We have a great story to tell. You have a great story to tell. So that's the purpose of the next several months is we're working with the industry. In fact, my, one of my key people is out with Hood today getting, and, and is gonna be down at Dean Foods in two weeks, and is going to every member of the Innovation Center board and saying, this is the plan you approved, now here's the communications plan for this, okay? You need to buy into it, because DMI, with all the money you put into DMI, if we're the only voice in the world that's talking about how you treat your animals and the great story you have in environment, it's not enough. And the old way of telling that story through advertising is dead. If we showed up with an ad as an industry with a $50 million ad, people go, that's big agriculture. I don't trust big agriculture. Those guys are lying to me. Just think of what's going on nationally in elections today. People don't trust. We've seen every trust barometer the last seven years, the lowest ever trust in government, the lowest ever trust in business, lowest ever. So we've gotta, we, we can't approach it with traditional methods. I have a video that's produced that is narrated by Mike Haddad, who's the CEO of Schreiber. It's just like a minute or so long. 
but it really tries to, in that short time frame, explain to you how we're trying to get the whole industry to work together using all their resources and assets to have a very loud voice. You know, we at DMI can have a loud voice, but you know, kind of small in the bigger picture. But if we think about how big this industry is and how many employees this industry is and how many partnerships we have with McDonald's and health professional partners and the World Wildlife Fund, we can have a huge, huge voice. One of the first things we're going to take on will be kind of a reactive thing still. It'll be antibiotics and clearing up the story on antibiotics over the next two or three months. But after that, next year, what you're going to look forward to is there's going to be two or three days, I don't know how many yet because we've got to really plan that out, where we're going to say, this is what we stand for, this is who we are, and let's move forward together. And we're going to have at the NGOs and all our third parties wrapped around us. So let's, let's play this video and then take any questions that we have. The Innovation Center for U.S. Dairy was formed eight years ago to provide a pre-competitive forum for the dairy community to proactively collaborate and align on issues, and more importantly, our opportunities. To strengthen the foundation of consumer trust in dairy, and thereby ensure an environment that allows all of us the freedom to operate and the right to sell our products, it's vitally important that we demonstrate an enduring commitment to continuous improvement and genuine transparency in our practices. With our new strategic plan, not only must we walk the walk, we must proactively and pervasively talk about our good work. We need to communicate to all stakeholders in a collaborative and coordinated fashion so that we may fully optimize our efforts to convey a unified story about dairy's relevance and social responsibility. In recent years, DMI has been developing and testing a variety of trust-building activities, including influencer and thought leader events, targeted content creation, and education forums to help the dairy community address the issues most important to today's consumers. But to ensure broad reach and lasting impact, it will take the whole of the dairy community to fully engage in building consumer trust. The power of the Innovation Center not only lies in the knowledge and experiences we have to share with each other, but also in the diversity and breadth of the stakeholder audiences we collectively reach. Achieving our vision that people trust dairy as essential to their lives can only be possible if we coordinate and collaborate fully to amplify a transparent and unified voice for our dairy community. checks were, that's really the end vision. That's where we're saying everybody together has a huge voice rather than individual players. So let's take by month, let's talk antibiotics, let's talk, you know, environmental stewardship, all the great things we have done, etc. So I think we have a few minutes for questions. If anyone would like to ask some questions, just raise your hand and stand. There's one in the back. One over here as well, next. I'll, uh, I'm just wondering, are you getting pushback uh, from any of your partners? I see that Almond Beverage is making inroads with Starbucks. Are you having any problems with McDonald's or any of those com companies? Yeah, you know, uh, while soy is on the d uh, decline, Almond has really picked up. I mean, Almond has become a very big competitor. And I suspect, I have to be honest with you, that as these companies look to be more and more decentralized to satisfy the local consumer. I don't, up until now, we've been successful at keeping competitors out, but I, I gotta believe at some point in some parts of the country, at least like California, wherever it is, you're gonna start seeing some of that. But uh, I think the, you know, our ability to, to hold on to that isn't gonna be forever, but I think we'll always be the largest player. How about right, right here, there's a question. Tom, a couple of the uh, uh, partners up there, like Shamrock evidently has a national contract with Subway. Hood had a national contract with Ponderosa when they existed. I guess I'm, from your perspective, you know, with the whole drive, people uh, wanting to buy local, know where their milk's, uh, foods produced and all this, that, and the other. 
are those retailers th rethinking that maybe a little bit? Because if I go into Subway and it's Shamrock Milk, who knows where Shamrock is? Who cares in the middle of the Midwest? Um, are those questions being raised or talked about? You know, uh, and I want to say this very carefully about the local phenomena. The local phenomena is, you know, I want to buy local. People, when they say that, and then their actual purchase patterns tend to be two different things, with the exception of the people who are really uh, more committed to, I want to buy something that's good for the earth. You know, it's a slice. There's a slice. But the mass consumers have not shown an actual what they say and what they do to be, to be aligned in terms of local. And, and if you think about the millennial consumer, oddly enough, because they believe in a global economy, a global world, an interconnected world, their view of local is way different than what yours and mine. They're, they don't think of local as it's got to be 50, 50 uh, miles within my house. Now, when I, when I talk about consumers, I always get nervous because there's no the consumer, right? There's, it doesn't even break by age hardly anymore or by sex. It breaks more by various beliefs that you have. And, and I, I think it's, it's, so it's not a simple question to answer, but if, if I were a niche company, I might look at local. If I were a broad-based company, it wouldn't cross my mind. I think the real opportunity uh, that, that is up here in front of us is really with these international partnerships, taking what we've learned that works effectively here in the United States and growing that internationally. I think that's a huge opportunity. Well, some of the data that I've read would suggest that millennials now hold 70% of the spending dollars or influence 70% of the dollars. What are we doing to address their interests and their needs? The, the uh, millennial consumer is, is an individual group does hold the largest purchasing power. 70% is, is a little high, but it's large. What's interesting about the millennial consumer is 35% of them are still living at home. 50% of them don't have the job they went to college for, and a good chunk of those aren't working, are, who are working are only working part-time. They have less income per capita than their parents. And yet, when they make purchases, they're, they're selective as a group. Well, again, we're painting a broad brush here. They, they're very selective that they're going to try to do good with their dollars as they purchase with brands. So. Um, we're spending a lot of time on the millennial and then the next that's following. Because the millennial is not only affecting purchases for themselves, by living at home, they're affecting their parents' purchases. It's not, it used to be you started becoming like your parents. The parents' purchasing patterns are becoming more like the millennials as they live at home. They're not going to buy multiple gallons of this type or that type or the other thing. Um, so the millennial will be front and center, one of our top three target audiences, obviously. Any other questions or thoughts? Well, listen, thanks a lot for your time. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to listen to me. Thank you.